Hi there, welcome back. It is time to discuss volatility in a little bit more detail. We will see that volatility is a very important quantity on the market and the fact that we use standard deviation to measure it, to approximate it, is just a convention. Actually, there are different measures that can be even better in specific situations. Towards the end of the class, we will introduce an important concept for other risk measures that we will discuss next week, that is to say the valid risk and the expected shortfall. That will be the concept of coherent risk measure, which is a particular type of measure with nice economic properties, but also mathematical properties. Enjoy! Now, what we cover today is another quantity which is extremely important in risk management, but in finance in general, and it's also one of the quantities involved in the Greeks, so that's why we need to say something more about it, and it's volatility. You recall that we have seen Viga, and Viga is the sensitivity of our portfolio to volatility. So. What we try to do today is to give a definition of volatility and to study a little bit the properties of this quantity, which is extremely important and also extremely dangerous if not treated properly. Now, volatility, uh, if you say volatility to the average financial guy on the market, it will say that volatility is essentially the standard deviation of the returns, okay? Now, the common definition is indeed that sigma, so our volatility, is the standard deviation of the returns provided by the variable of interest, so for example, the price of an asset, per unit of time, and the continuous compounding. So, as I told you last time in this course, we essentially play with continuous compounding, so we assume everything to be continuous when we play with interest rates and how we compound capital and interest. And the unit of time will be depending on the type of quantity we are analyzing. So for example, when we play with market risk, it will be most of the time daily variations. So the unit of time will be a day. It can also be the intraday. So it can be an hour, a minute, less than a minute, but we will not enter into that, that is high frequency uh, stuff. So we don't cover that. So for us in market would be essentially a day, the unit of time. Uh, when we play with credit risk, it is typically something different. It can be something like a year, a year, uh, a decade. So depending on the time horizon of the, of the investment. So it can be a very long time. So typically there is a difference between market and credit, and so for operational and all the other type of risks that we will consider together. But what I want to stress, and I will say over and over again today, but also later on when we enter into market risk, is that this is nothing more than a convention that we should use until it makes sense. If, to, if we enter in a situation in which we know that using the standard deviation is not a clever choice, we, just, we should stop using the standard deviation, because otherwise we are introducing modal risk. So using a tool which is not the appropriate one and getting numbers that essentially are meaningless. Now, as I told you, we start with dealing with market risk. So that will be the first big risk we will play together. So let's say something about returns or daily returns again for the fact that we are speaking about market. Now, I call SI the, the value of the quantity of interest. So for example, take SI to be the price of my assets at the end of the I, okay? I'm taking the closing price, I could say the starting price is not important. Here is just the end of the day. Now, the continuously compounded daily return on day I can be expressed in two ways we can use the log returns and the percent returns. In log returns, we just take log of SI over SI minus one. So SI is today, SI minus one is yesterday. Uh, if, I, if I want to compute the percent returns, I will just take the difference between today and yesterday over yesterday, okay? Now, what is important to stress, and already here there is a small component of modal risk, is the following. 
if the market is in standard conditions, so everything is okay, there is no turbulence, there is no excessive volatility, there is nothing particularly uh, bad happening or extremely good happening, huh? because it can also be on the other side. If there is a lot of enthusiasm on the market, it cannot still be a, be a problem in a certain <laughs> sense from the modeling point of view. If there is nothing like that, if the probability of a big jump up or down in the prices, for example, can be assumed to be zero or very close to zero, then essentially it's not important which one of the two definitions you use. You will get approximately the same value. If this is not the case, so for example, if you are in a situation of turbulence on the market, the two definitions will tend to diverge. So they will tend to give different values. And that's important. Because obviously, if my model relies on log returns and your model relies on the percent returns, we can see differences that can also be relatively important. And they are essentially due to the fact that we're using different units. Okay? So that's always very important to know which definition we are dealing with. Okay, let's assume that we want to compute the daily volatility. Okay? So I call sigma n the volatility in the n. And I want to estimate these from day n minus 1. Okay, so when I start day n, I get this estimate of the volatility in day n based on the information I have until day n minus 1. Now, what I do is the following. I define the variance. So since in until now, for us, volatility is the standard deviation of the returns of the variable of interest, the standard deviation is nothing more than the square root of the variance. Okay, so I define the variance, sigma square n, and then I just set, to ease a little bit my equations, un to be the log returns, okay? If un are the log returns, I can essentially compute the variance in the usual way. So as you all well know from computing the variance of a, of a finite sample, okay? So it would be 1 over n minus 1, where n is the last n days of observations, and n would be something that I can decide myself, or something that is imposed by the regulator, but for us for the moment is just a is just a parameter. So I just consider the last n day and I take one over n minus one and then I take what? I take the sum of the squared distances of each observation u n minus i, where i goes from one to m, and the mean, which is u bar. Now n minus 1, you remember from your basic courses in statistics, is essentially due to the fact that you are correcting for the small sample, okay, in order to add nice properties of your uh, statistic. This is what we will call definition 1, okay? So in definition 1, we used log returns, and this is the way in which we compute the variance. Once we have that number, we take the square root. That would be the standard deviation. That would be our estimate of the volatility in the n. If instead of the log returns, I use the percent returns, now un represents the percent returns, and I make an assumption which is rather common, and we will say more about that later on, which is the fact that we assume the average to be zero. So if we take the percent return, we say that essentially that will be some sort of random variable characterized by a measure of variability, the standard deviation that for us is volatility, uh, but the average is zero. So on average, we, we can expect the variation to be zero. If we do that, essentially, since the first moment is zero, so when you take the square of zero is zero, the, the, uh, the variance is now 1 over n minus 1, the sum of the squares. Uh, this is the finite sample. If you want the maximum likelihood estimator, you can ignore the n minus 1, just use m. When you have a large sample, when m is large, essentially, there is no particular, no particular difference in these, two, in these two estimators without entering into the discussion about the properties of the estimators. This is what we call definition two. Now, 
Let's consider a simple example. Imagine that we have the observation on the stock price of some asset uh, at the end of each of the last 15 days, okay? So these are 30.2, 32, 31.1, and so on, until 29.9, okay? So we see that there are some variations in this stock price. If we use the two approaches, definition one and definition two, under definition one, what we have is a daily volatility of 2.28, under definition 2 is 2.24. They are close enough. Also consider that we are only playing with 15 observations, okay? So if you increase the number of observations, they will be closer, actually. Uh, they are close enough, but still they are not the same, okay? Even in this very simple example. And here we are essentially assuming that the market is in nice condition, nothing terrible happening. You see that there is no big junk in the value of the stock price, okay? It's just a matter of a few decimals, okay? If you introduce big jumps, so for example, take this 30.9 and make it 39, okay? You will see that the, the difference between the two definitions will increase, okay? Because again, we are dropping the idea that we are in standard market conditions. Okay, these are the two definitions. Now, let's start discussing some of the assumptions that are commonly made on the market when we play with, with volatility. The most <laughs> common one, and at least in my humble opinion, one of the most dangerous one, is the following. We assume that the daily returns okay, can be approximated by a normal distribution with mean zero and a given standard deviation sigma that we will try to estimate. So what we are saying is that our returns will be something like that, centered in zero, and here we will have our sigma. Moreover, we assume that the returns so if I consider the daily returns, and I consider the returns today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, one week from now, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and so on, they are IID. IID means that they are identically, independently distributed. It means that we are assuming that each day is like that. So we have normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation sigma. And we are also assuming that today is independent from yesterday, and it's independent from tomorrow, so tomorrow is independent from yesterday, and so on. So there is independence, which again is not a particularly clever assuming that on the market every day we forget what happened the day before. Somehow you are saying that. But if you do that, it's true that you can easily show that if you take the returns over a certain fixed time horizon, say capital T days, then if the daily volatility is a sigma, the volatility over the T days will be sigma, the square root of T. This is what is commonly called time adaptation. Now, how can you see that? Now, assume that my returns are normally distributed, so this is x1, normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma square, okay? Now, if I want to compute the variance of x1, what is that? It is just sigma square, okay? So it's sigma square. So if I want to compute the standard deviation of x1, it is what? It's the square root of sigma square, which is sigma. Okay. A little bit pedantic, but now you will see why. Now assume that I have the second day, and the second day for me is x2, which I'm also assuming to be a normal within zero and variance sigma squared the same. 
and they are independent, okay? So if you want to write that in mathematical terms, you're saying that x1 is independent from x2. Okay, now they are independent. What does it mean? It means that if now I consider the variance of x1 plus x2, what do I know? I know that the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variances plus two times the covariance and blah, blah, blah. But if they are independent, the covariance is zero. So in that particular case of independence, the variance of the sum is just the sum of the variances. So it would be the variance of the first one plus the variance of the second one. So this is two times sigma squared. Now, I want to compute the standard deviation of x1 plus x2. It will be the square root of 2 times sigma squared, which is what? It's sigma square root of 2. If I do for 3, it will be x1, x2, x3. 3 times sigma squared. If I take the square, the square root, it is what? Sigma square root of 3. If I do that t times, it will be sigma square root of t. Because every time I'm just adding a sigma square and then I collect and I have the, the t coming out. Okay. First thing, it's very simple, okay? Nothing particularly complicated. And if this is true, you understand, but it is not true, but if it is true, you understand why on the market there is a saying saying that uncertainty and uncertainty for us is measured by volatility. Again, also here there is a problem because volatility is not necessarily the best measure of uncertainty. But if you assume that it works and so on, uncertainty increases with the square root of times. Okay? As simple as that. Now, what happens if this is true? So if volatility increases with the square root of time, then it's extremely simple to perform your computations because assume that you have the daily volatility that you have estimated as you prefer. We will see a few techniques. We have, have already considered two, okay? We can have a little bit more sophisticated techniques, but once I have the daily volatility, I can project by taking the square root of the time horizon I want to consider. So if I want to use the calendar year, it will be the square root of three, 365 or 366. If I want to compute that on the business calendar, depending if you are in the US or if you are in the Eurozone or if you are in different markets, it will be the square root of the number of days, okay? 252, 256, and so on. That's simple. We all agree. So we just need to compute the daily volatility and then we can project. But this is true until the daily returns are IID, identically independently distributed. Now, you may assume that, even without being extremely technical, you may assume that we have market, good market conditions. Okay, so today the market is in good conditions. Fine is not a big assumption to extend this idea of good market condition to tomorrow. So if today the market is in good conditions, tomorrow is likely to be in the same conditions. In three days from now, again, but saying that in one year from now, we already know that it will be in the same conditions, it starts becoming quite a strong assumption. Okay, so in a few days everything can, can happen, imagine in one year. Okay, so you can always have the president of one of the biggest countries in the world saying something not particularly clever, or another uh, corporation taking a stupid decision. I mean, many things can happen. But assume that Again, normality, so this fact is somehow safe. So let's assume that normality holds. So we are in this wonderful world in which everyone is rich and beautiful. 
and assume that the asset price is the, the, of the asset that we are considering today is 50 euros. And we know that the vol daily volatility is 1.5. Now, why it is so nice to play with a normal distribution? Because you can have simple formulas like that, but also because you can, for example, easily build, it's not fundamental to use a normal distribution to build a confidence interval, but for sure is one of the simplest situations in which you can build a confidence interval. So what you have, if you assume that the daily changes are normally distributed and independent, so again, they are IID, you can build easily a confidence interval. You remember from your courses in statistics that, for example, if I want to build a 95% confidence interval, what can I do? I can take the value that I observe, 50, plus minus 1.96, which is the quantile of a standard normal, such that 2.5 on the right, 2.5% on the left. And I multiply by what? By the standard deviation. Now, the daily volatility there is expressed as a percentage, 1.5%. What we have to do is to transform this percentage to absolute terms. So the 1.5% of what? Of 50. So 1.96 times 50 times 0 0.015. I do that, and you will see that you have this confidence interval that tells me that if the world follows what I believe, I have a 95% confidence interval that the variation I will observe will be between 48.53 and 51.47. Again, it's convenient. <coughs> the problem is, is the normality assumption meaningful? So does it make sense to assume normality. Now, here, little digression. The fact, this is something, I mean, at the end of this course, I hope you will all pass the exam with a fantastic grade. I hope you will retain in your mind some of the stuff, because it's also useful for everyday life. And if you go and ask for a mortgage at a bank at a certain point, it's always nice to know how, what they do. And for example, I will teach you how they decide the fact that he gets a mortgage and he does not get a mortgage. According to which fantastic formula, actually not in, nothing particularly fantastic, but it's always nice to know these kind of things. Or if you open your financial newspaper and you read something, it's always nice to understand what is written there. Now, one thing that I want, in any case, even if you forget everything of what I'm telling you in this course, one thing that I really hope you will retain is that even if Everyone assumes something, there is no guarantee that that assumption is correct. Okay? And sometimes on the market, knowing that certain assumptions are made and may not and usually do not hold, can be an advantage for you. You can make money out of that because you know how people think, or at least how they build their models. Because many people in financial industry know very well that the normality assumption does not hold. But since it's a sort of convention, they use it. And sometimes they are also imposed the use of certain models by the regulator, as we will see. So it's not that everyone is stupid. It's not like that. But unfortunately, for many reasons, these models are used, even if sometimes or very often they don't work. So the fact of the normality assumption is that there are good chances it does not work. For many reasons. So when you look at the charts of the market, I mean, if you look at the time series of the, the price of whatever asset, or if you consider interest rates or whatever, you will see that this time series is characterized by a certain number of empirical facts that in finance, in statistics, have different names. But for sure, you, you have noticed at least once in your lifetime that if you have this graph of the price, 
you will see that sometimes you're here, then you jump over, then you go down, something like that. It means that if I compute the volatility, so you have pe periods in which there is a small volatility and periods in which there is a higher volatility. So that if I plot the volatility, I will see something like this and then something like, okay, I'm over-exaggerating, so everyone can see that. But the idea is the following. So there are periods of low volatility and periods of high volatility that tend to cluster. This is what we call volatility clustering. So you observe periods in which there are relatively small variations, periods of a lot of variations. But why? Because it can be, for example, a period of crisis when everyone is trying to sell, or it can be a period of extreme growth when, in which everyone is buying. Think of what happened, for example, with Bitcoin and the point in which at a certain point it was just rocketing and then bam. Okay? If you were considering the volatility when it was just rocketing, it was quite high. Why? Because there are a lot of transactions, there are a lot of happiness, most of the time not very rational, but still, when there is a lot of happiness and a lot of sadness on the market, you see these kind of things. Other things that we will consider together are fat-tailed distributions. So we might assume that the distribution is a normal, and in reality, the real distribution is fat-tailed. Fat-tailed means that the tail, the right and the left, are fatter, so bigger here. So they assign a larger mass to large profits and large losses, large returns and large negative returns, okay? And also in that situation, for example, uh, I will try to show you that there are situations in which using the standard deviation as a measure of volatility is not safe for a simple reason. Theoretically, it does not exist. What does it mean that it does not exist? If the true distribution is the pink one and not the white one, it might happen that I'm computing the volatility in my sample, and since I have a finite number of observations, I will always be able to compute a number, but the phenomenon behind is so erratic that a few observations that can completely destroy the number that I have um, observed. A very simple example, but then we will be a little bit more technical later in the course, is the following. Assume that we are computing the average income in this classroom, okay? So I start from him, I ask him, what's your income number? Then I ask him, I ask him, I ask her, and so on. And every time I compute the, the average, at a certain point, I will have the average of the entire classroom, okay? A number, whatever. Do you agree with me that if some of your colleagues from the next classroom enters, the value will be recomputed? Obviously, we have a next observation, but we can assume that the value will be more or less similar to the value that we have already computed since we are already above 50, 60 people here. Okay? But what happens if the guy entering is not your friend? next door, but it's Jack Bezos. Then the number that we have computed is totally useless because it will ju jump from a few thousand euros to million, okay? Just because of one observation. This is what typically you can observe under fat tails. It means that there is a maybe small, but not zero, probability of very large losses, very large profits, and one, and once one of these observations appears in your sample, the number that you have computed is useless. So it's just one, and you can throw everything away. Under normality, that cannot happen. In reality, we know that that happens, okay? I will show you that under normality, we can assume, for example, a two sigma event, or a three sigma event, or a four sigma event. What is a three sigma event? It's an event which is three standard deviation, three sigmas from the mean, okay? So a three sigma event would be something like here, let's say. If this is sigma, 
one, two, three, would be somewhere here, okay? Under the normal distribution, a three sigma event is something that you can essentially ignore. The probability of that is very, very small. It's not zero, but it's very, very small. In reality, we will see that a three sigma event, while under the normal distribution, it's something that you could expect every two, three years, on the markets, you see that every few months, okay? So there is a difference between expecting a loss every three years and every three months. Uh, sometimes we use normality. Sometimes it makes sense. It makes sense because assuming it is balanced by the fact that we can simplify a lot of our computations so we can have quick results and quick computations, but it only makes sense if you have a short time horizon. So a few days can be relatively safe to assume normality. Long time horizons, no. As I'm writing there, it's like believing in horoscopes. You can do that. You're totally free to do that. Good chances you are wrong, okay? What happens if we are, for example, in the situation of a fat tail distribution in which the, we know theoretically that the standard deviation is not an appropriate measure of volatility? Uh, you can use other uh, you can use other uh, tools. There are many. The the MAD the MAD can be the mean absolute deviation, sometimes the median absolute deviation. Uh, indices of variability like the Gini index, like the Pietra index, there are measures, okay? And these measures that we will not use in this course, nonetheless exist, and they can be used. So later on, if you will go on, if you will go on into your study of risk management, that one day you will work in a risk management department, knowing that there are alternatives is always nice. Now, Let's see a little bit more technical topics. Nothing particularly scary, uh, but let's take one of the two definitions, definition two, okay? But you can use definition one, just to be consistent from now on. Now, what we have seen that under definition two, which is the definition uh, that relies on the percent, uh, percent returns, uh, well, uh, the variance sigma square n can be computed in that way, okay? So it was this equation without the alpha. Now the point is, since I'm taking the last n days of observations, because these are daily volatilities, but I can take the last m hours if I'm using uh, hourly volatilities, so the last n units of time, if I take the last n days, it can make sense to say that what happened yesterday and the day before yesterday to me is more important than what happened 10 days ago, okay? So what I do, I can introduce weights. I can introduce weights that I call alpha, alpha one, alpha n, such that the mass, so the weight I put on the observation of yesterday is larger than the weight I can assign to the observation of two days ago, three days ago, four days ago, and so on, until the last observation and days ago, to which I assign a weight which is the smallest one. And I assume that these weights all sum to one, okay? So I'm considering a convex linear combination of the observations. So weighting, it's something that is commonly done on the market. And it makes sense because I'm saying that what happened yesterday or close to me in terms of time, it's more important than what happened longer, uh, longer ago in the past. Now, by playing with weighting, we can actually introduce a lot of models. How many of you attended the course time series? Okay, the large majority. Now, in that, in that course, I hope, but I'm pretty sure you did, you considered towards the end of the course some models 
for volatility, like this, the ARCH, the ARCH model. Now, ARCH is an acronym for autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model. I totally don't care. But the H is the most important part. H, heteroscedastic, heteroscedastic that can be written in different ways. Hetero, different, scedastic, variability. Heteroscedastic means that the variability changes. If you consider homoscedastic, you are assuming that volatility is constant, does not change. It's three, okay? It's a normal with volatility three. If it is heteroscedastic, it is a normal or whatever other distribution in which the volatility changes. Maybe every day, maybe every three days, that we don't know, but it changes over time. Now, in these models that are autoregressive in the sense that you are taking a dependence structure between what happens today, what happened yesterday, the day before yesterday, so there is an autoregression. You are regressing a variable against it itself. So you have these models that has autoregressive component to explain the fact that there is a change in the, in the volatility. Now, what can we do? In the, in the previous slide, we have introduced the weights. Okay, sigma square n was supposed to be the sum from, uh, from 1 to n of alpha i u n minus i squared. Now, I introduce another term that I call gamma vl, where vl is a number that I call long run variance. <laughs> now, the idea of these models is the following. We have our volatility process. So volatility is a random quantity that we are trying to model, and this volatility changes over time. But if we wait long enough, the idea of this model is that at a certain point, these oscillations that we say we can see daily or intradaily will tend to decrease and we will converge towards a long run variance. So the idea is that I'm in a situation in which I have my variance here and it will go like that until in the long run it will converge towards a value here which is VL. Okay, that's the idea of this type, the intuition of this type of methods. Now, if I do that, I say that now my variance sigma square n is equal to gamma VL, this number that possibly I have to estimate, and then the same object as before, the sum of u squared and I n minus i with uh, the weights applied in front. What I assume, since I still want a convex combination, is that now, instead of just the i's to sum to 1, I add gamma, and I also assume that everything sums to 1. Now, this is what we call an arch m model. It's one of the models that can be used to estimate volatility. Why? Because, obviously, I study the variance, and then, at the end, I take the square root. Now, quite common to express gamma VL as a single quantity that goes under the name of omega. Now, these models can be studied, estimated statistically. We will not do that. But what we can do is to introduce a model that, in principle, generalizes these models, the arch. This model goes under the name of GARCH, where the G stands for generalized, so generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model. And if you start saying, okay, this is already very long, there are much more complicated models, 
And at a certain point, the problem is not estimating the model, but recalling the name of the acronym, because it's extremely long. But if you want to generalize that, you can introduce the GARCH. Now, the GARCH is a rather subtle topic in the sense that uh, it can be safely introduced. It's not particularly difficult to understand that. But if you want to master GARCH models, then it's not at all trivial. The only type of GARCH model that we will consider, and very briefly, is the GARCH 1-1. Now, you remember I told you that this is an arch M model. M stands for the number of days I'm considering. Okay? If I say that my volatility depends on the last 10 days, that will be an arch 10. If I say that volatility depends on the last two days, it will be an arch 2. In a GARCH 1 1, I'm just saying that all that matters for me is what happened yesterday. Okay, just one leg in the past. And this is how the model is defined. So I say that my sigma square n is equal to gamma VL, and this is totally in line with what we have seen in the arch model, alpha, and then since there is only one, alpha one, we call it alpha, alpha u n minus one squared, and again, this is totally consistent with an arch one model, but I add, and that's why it is generalized, a new term. I add beta sigma square n minus one. So what I'm saying is that the value of the variance today and then of the volatility, because I will take the square root, is what? Is a function of a long run trend, the long run variance. What happened on the returns yesterday, which is the U component, but also really the value of the variance yesterday. Okay, so the volatility today is a function of a long run component. What happened to the returns yesterday and the value of the volatility yesterday. These three parameters, gamma, alpha, and beta, sum to one again. So I know that <laughs> alpha plus gamma plus beta is equal to 1. Now, in time series, if you attended the course, you know a little bit more about that. For me, what is just sufficient is that you recall this, this form. By the way, little digression, and then we stop for the break. For the exam, okay, try to understand how they come out. So here, the idea is that we started by adding weights because we thought that adding weights makes sense, and that makes sense. And then we say, OK, but essentially, we can stop with information we have about yesterday. Why? Not because we don't think that knowing what happened one week ago is not important, but because that information is already somehow contained in the last term, the volatility itself. So we are keeping memory of that one day to the other. Okay, so we can stop uh, for the break.